So let's talk about whether national conservatism uh, has a place in the UK and whether now is the moment. Um, I, I'll, I'll begin with the obvious question, what is national conservatism? Um, the, the simplest answer to what is national conservatism uh, is that it's the opposite of liberal internationalism. You know, there's this, this, this phrase, national conservatism, it, it, has, it, it, it does pop up every, you know, every 50 or 100 years in Anglo-American history. It, it has some precedence. But in our context, nas national conservatism arises from the, from the, the impulse to uh, Brexit and to the Trump movement. And that impulse is, um, to, to take a complicated thing and simplify it, I'll, I'll make it simple later, later. You can call me on it. I'll apologize. I'll make it more complicated. But for now, it's, it, is, um, it is an impulse that says, look, for uh, 25 or 30 years, um, there, there have, there's been a, 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 a consensus across the major political parties in, in America, in Europe, and, and to, to many other democratic countries. There's been a consensus that the, uh, that the age of the nation state, the age of national independence is over. Um, the, the, the standard way of framing this uh, globalist argument, the standard way of framing it is to say, look, uh, in the 20th century, there were three candidates for a reasonable way of thinking about politics. There was communism, there was fascism, and there was liberal democracy. Okay, so liberalism. And people who, uh, I'm sure you've all heard this many, many times, and people who look at things from that perspective, they say, well, look, we, uh, we, we defeated uh, fascism, authoritarianism, we, no one wants that. And we defeated Marxism, and nobody wants that. And so by process of elimination, we can deduce that the right thing for the entire planet for all future generations is, is, uh, is liberalism. And uh, that has given birth to, uh, to you know, a, a great many organizations and theories and in, in institutions, uh, the World Economic Forum, the European Union, the World Trade Organization, uh, the United Nations in, as well, and, and many others. And although these are different institutions, we can generalize and say that in general, the, the moving spirit is this spirit of globalism, by which I mean liberal internationalism. Okay, now, so what is that? Um, liberalism, okay, now, he, this is the definition part. Liberalism is, uh, is a political standpoint that, that, that says, look, if you want to understand the political world, there's a, there's a few things you, you, you fundamentally need to understand. First, ne you need to understand uh, that human beings, all human beings, in all times and places, they are, are free and equal by nature, perfectly free and perfectly equal in some texts. Human beings are free and equal by nature. Second, they, human beings take on moral obligations and political obligations on the basis of consent. If you agree to have an obligation, then you're obligated. If you don't agree to have an obligation, well, it would be t unfair. It's practically slavery to say that someone has an obligation that he or she didn't agree to. And the third part of it is, is a, a thesis, a proposal about the legitimate powers of government, where uh, liberals will say, what is, what is government for? Government exists in order to protect the individual liberties and equalities that are, belong to all human beings by nature. Okay, so now, th that used to be a worldview that was familiar from you know, certain political parties in, uh, in the UK, in the United States, in France, and elsewhere. But at, for at least a generation, let's say arbitrarily, since the fall of the Berlin Wall, or maybe we could say uh, si si since uh, Margaret Thatcher left the political scene in 1990, since then, the argument has sort of expanded. And from the moment of George H.W. Bush's uh, New World Order speech, the, the theory of, of uh, liberalism has become a, a global theory. And the, the idea is simply, there are no competing ways of looking at the political world. This is the right way for all people to look at the political world. And since it's the right way, well, th there are no remaining projects really other than to make sure that these ideas, that this liberal idea is spread to every country in the world 
and you know, if necessary, by force. And that way, we will bring some kind of you know, end of history. It really is a utopian vision. And against this, we, um, we, see, all sorts of, we see all sorts of rebels. At the, at this, the, there are also uh, rebels in the non-democratic world. But if we focus on the democracies, we see that at the very least since 2016, since Bre Brexit and, and, and uh, the, the, the Trump movement, there has been an expression, an effective, well, somewhat effective, uh, a political expression of a, an unwillingness to accept this. Fundamentally, it comes down to what used to be called, what should be called again, uh, national independence. That there is some kind of, many people feel that there is actually some kind of um, important constructive good that is achieved by the fact that there are, there are different nations, that there are borders between them, that they have different legal systems, they have different values, and that each one pursues uh, its own uh, interests on the basis of its own traditions, its own way of understanding things. Now, this, this worldview is obviously you know, completely incompatible, this kind of nationalism. Let's use the word nationalism tonight to mean um, that uh, a view that says that the, the world is governed best when many nations are given their independence and allowed to chart their own, their own course according to their own traditions and values. So this, from a liberal internationalist perspective, from a globalist perspective, this kind of uh, Brexit and Trump and Maloney and uh, uh, um, uh, Orban, Netanyahu, this, this kind of... Um, rejection of the coming globalist order in the name of national independence from the perspective of the globalists, it's, well, well, we know how they think about it because the, w the way they think about it is, look, there's only three options. We already said there's fascism, there's, there's communism, and there's liberalism, and we're the liberals. So there, there is no alternative. I I'm sorry if this sounds too simplistic. It's unfortunately very close to being accurate. The, it, it, it is that that you 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 read um, lengthy, learned uh, treatises in you know in the press and in academia over and over again, showing showing that if there are people who are resisting liberalism, then they must be fascists. I, I mean that because there's only three things. There's only three things you can look at. And so, from a certain seen from a certain perspective, uh, the the uh, Brexit and the Trump movement, and you, you've you've all heard this repeatedly, and, and the rest of the characters I named plus more, uh, are a throwback to a world of you know violent competition, which you know ends up being very quickly authoritarian and fascist, and they're very very worried about this because they're liberal and they don't want fascism. Is there a different way of looking at this? Well. From the beginning, um, I and, and various friends of, uh, of, of mine have um, thought that this way of looking at things is, is not just phenomenally unfair, I mean untrue, uh, but also phenomenally um, imprudent. Because if liberalism is the only alternative to fascism, communism, um, then you will begin if liberalism makes any mistakes, if there's anything wrong with it, if it's problematic in theory or in practice, in any sort of way, you will begin pushing people who are looking at it into the arms of communists and fascists, which is, in fact, something that has been happening. There is a different way of, of looking at things. So what is the alternative? Well, let's, let's look at it this way. If the liberals are the ones who are saying uh, that it, it, everything you need to know about politics, roughly, is individual liberty and consent and the things that flow from them. If, the, if those are the liberals, okay, and we, we, we can see that you know, beyond, on the other side of liberalism, there's this you know, woke neo-Marxism, various kinds of Marxism. On the far reaches of the political spectrum, um, there, there's also people who, instead of putting the individual, individual rights at the center, put race at the center of their politics. 
uh, there, there, really are, there really are such groups um, on, on, on the fringes of democratic society. And, and some, some of the people writing for them actually have a following. And uh, we can say more about that later. But what about the space in between? Because the, the, the Trump voters and the Brexit voters, they, th this you know, vast, uh, vast number, uh, tens of millions of people, they fall in between liberalism, as I've defined it, and, uh, and, and these racialist groups. They're in, they're in between. There's, a, there's this gigantic space in which you know, most conservatives, people who, who, who use the term conservative, they're in this space. Isn't there such a thing as conservatism? And bizarrely, um, we, we can go into the reasons of, for, for this later, but bizarrely, the, the, w for, for years we've been hearing that no, there's nothing else, there is nothing in that space but authoritarianism. Anybody in that space is, is a deplorable, is a fascist, is a semi-fascist, is on the way to fascism. And you try to say, well, well wait a second. Isn't there you know, something called Anglo-American conservatism, which has a, you know, a, a spectacular tradition going back five, six, seven hundred years? It, d doesn't that exist? And they tell you, no, 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 no. Conservatism in, in Britain is liberalism. Conservatism in the United States is liberalism. And I, I promise you, they do the same thing in Europe. In France, they say, no, no, conservatism is, is liberalism. It's the values of the French Revolution. In Germany, they say the same thing. Conservatism is liberalism. All right, so I, this, th this new book, it, 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 it begins from the premise that this is ridiculous. I'm sorry, and I, it, it's, it's not a nice way to talk about so many, so many intelligent people, but they're really, they're really not being particularly intelligent about this. Let's, let's make a simple distinction between liberalism and conservatism. I, I said before, if, if you think that politics is based on uh, individual liberties, then you're some kind of a liberal. You might be a progressive liberal, you might be a classical liberal, you might be a libertarian, but you're some kind of liberal. But when you start looking into what motivates these Brexit voters and these Trump voters and, 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 and the, the, the parallel groupings in other countries, what you discover is that, that these, these people are uh, looking at the world from what I'll call a conservative perspective. What do I mean by that? I mean that, that they begin, conservatives begin by saying, look, it's a, there's a given. The given is our inher inheritance. There's an inherited nation that we didn't build, that our ancestors, ancestors built, and, and now we're a part of that. There's an inherited religion or religions that we didn't invent, our ancestors invented them, and an and inherited language. Inherited legal system, inherited constitution. Now we, we can you know throw all these things away, but 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 they exist. A conservative begins and says, "What do I need to do? What what do I need to do? What do we need to do if if, if we want to assure the continuation of this inheritance into the future, to repair it where it's running down because uh, the." The traditional conservative thinkers are, are very clear that all human things decay and that if you want to preserve something, the only way to conserve it is, is occasionally to restore it, to repair it. So, so the question becomes, what do I need to do in order to restore the things, the parts of the inheritance that were worthy and have been lost, to, to strengthen them, to make it possible to hand to my children and their children and their children something that that continues what I inherited, and, and if possible, is, is significantly stronger, is, is better built than what I inherited. That, that's a conservative approach. Now, obviously, conservatives can uh, and, and, and usually do in, in Britain and America and other English-speaking countries have a special place for, uh, for questions of individual liberty. But notice that, that those questions are not the framework. They're not the entire framework for politics. The framework for politics begins on what have we inherited. And the, the rights that we value, that we cherish, those rights are part of the inheritance. They are traditional. The, the, there, there is no way to claim that everybody on earth is going to come to them because it's only here in England and then later in other countries inf influenced by England that, that, that these rights ever existed. So immediately, as a conservative, you, you begin by saying, 
I don't know. I don't know to what extent these rights are applicable in the entire world. I don't know whether it's reasonable to send my sons and my daughters to the other side of the planet to try to impose these these ideas. And by the way, these rights have limits. They have traditional limitations to them. You, you can't simply say, as as liberals have been saying since the 1960s, that look. Pornography, prostitution, abortion, what, what, whatever. I, you don't have to agree with me on every single one of these points, but I, you have to understand what, what's at issue here. That during the 1960s, after World War II, beginning in the 1940s, reaching a, a, a kind of a crescendo in the 1960s, this Enlightenment liberal vision that all we need for, for a constitution is rights. We don't need anything else for a constitution. We, we need rights and equality and, and for people to live according to consent. That theory that, that this liberalism is sufficient to be able to replace everything that's inherited, it, it begins quietly and then becomes a roar. And two generations later, it, it's difficult to find young people who know how to think about, in, about politics in any other way other than these are my rights. No, th no, those are my rights. They, they can't think about anything else. They, they, they don't have the, the, uh, the categories to, to, to talk about, you know, what would we have to do if we wanted something to be conserved? Because they think that it's obvious everybody should get rights. Now, surprise, in the year 2020, we discovered something that, you know, wasn't obvious to everyone. And that is that if you raise two generations, two, three generations of young people, and you tell them, don't worry about your inheritance. Don't worry about the past. Think for yourself. Just, just figure it out. Use reason. Reason for yourself. And I'm sure you'll come to the right answers. I'm sure that'll make you happy. I'm sure that, that everything will be OK. Two, three generations of young people raised that way. And guess what? It turns out that a great many of them exercise reason, and they come to woke neo-Marxism as the thing that their reason has brought them to. There's also some who exercise reason and, and, and come to all of these you know, s strange fascistic things that are, 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 are popping up on the, on, on the right. But, but the, the big news is that as of 2020, as of, the year 20, as of the moment that the New York Times begins firing senior employees because they're liberals, as of that moment, the, the, the 60 years of liberal hegemony, the, the hegemony of liberal ideas, the consensus that liberalism was basically all you need, that consensus has collapsed. Now, there's still plenty of liberals running around, but, but be, be careful. The fact there are liberals, liberals running around doesn't mean that that liberal consensus still exists. It does not exist. It, you, you'll tell me more about the UK. I, you know, I, I admit my knowledge of, of, of what's happening here is, is, is limited, and you'll help me with that. But in the United States, in, in the year 2020, the great majority of institutions, private and public, in, it, within the, over the course of a year or two, went over from you know, the, this traditional liberal view that we described to something completely new, the woke neo-Marxism. We can talk about exactly what it is, but it's certainly not liberalism. It's certainly not liberalism. So all of a sudden, the, in America, in, in the UK, in various other countries, there's a bid being made to impose a new hegemonic set of ideas, and it's not liberalism. And liberalism is not going to stop it. Liberalism is not going to come back. If liberalism had the power to stop it, liberalism, it, it never would have happened in the first place. What's happening is that the, the, gener the, the two generations of Enlightenment liberals who've been taught that all you need to do is reason and think for yourself and don't worry about your inheritance and don't worry about the past, guess what? They don't know how to conserve anything. And so there is nothing from the past that's being conserved. Right? And again, I'll, I'll name some things. You don't have to agree with me that they're all valuable. But just, just think about the history for a moment. What, what has been overthrown since, you know, since the 1950s and the 1960s? Well, let's start with God and scripture, nation and family, right? And now man and woman, honor, the sacred, loyalty. I, I mean, you, you could keep going. I mean, basically, we're looking at the the, the, the entire set of concepts and values that were, the, that were the traditional framework before the two world wars, 
that that created, you know, the, the, this extraordinary um, uh, land of Britain that created America, that created many other remarkable countries. All of these values have been first criticized, then relativized, then ma then 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 v viciously attacked, and now overthrown. And the moment that we're living in, the moment, this moment now, is a moment in which first there's the struggle to see whether it's possible to prevent woke neo-Marxism from destroying absolutely everything in its path, because it will. That's first. Second, there, there, there is this remarkable um, contest taking place to the, to the immediate right of liberals, many people saying, look, I, look liberalism, it, it didn't work. It, it's collapsed. It was supposed to last forever. It lasted two generations. There are even people who, who, who aren't saying that are saying liberalism is not enough. It's clearly not enough. We, we need something else. What's the something else? And there's this spectacular, just wonderful, uh, just at the intellectual level, debate in which Unheard has been, you know, one, one of the one of the leading uh, publications. But it, but it's taking place across thousands of people participating in it in different countries to try to understand what what is going to come in place of liberalism, what is going to what's going to be what's going to be strong enough to meet woke neo Marxism and to defeat it. We need something strong enough to do that. Now, the intuitions of a great many voters. Now, there are many. When you have an election, um, there are many different issues. Many vo different voters are, are are motivated by different issues. It's too simplistic to take any election and say, "Oh, you know, it's simply this one issue that decided it." Yet, I'm going to be that simplistic because what all of these voters, although. <laughs> There are many different streams and there are many different versions within this national conservative space. What all of them are saying in one way or another is basic ideas, institutions, principles, ways of life that were the bedrock of my life and my parents' lives and their lives, that these things are being taken away from us. All of those Trump voters and Brexit voters and Maloney voters and Orban voters and, 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 and so on in, in other countries, they're all saying there is something that we've inherited. For example, national independence, something that we inherited from our ancestors, and, and, and we're not willing to give this up. We're actually willing to fight in order to prevent this from disappearing. All right. What that means, if that's correct, if, 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 if I'm right that that's what's happening, what that means is that the, the UK voter who went and voted for Brexit, or the American voter who voted for Trump, they w were probably motivated by particular issues that were bothering them. They might be motivated by f fear of too much Im uh, uh, immigration from other countries. They might be motivated by uh, a, a you know a kind of a prideful revulsion at the idea that somebody in in Brussels or Berlin picks up the phone and and dictates what has to happen in 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 uh, in, in the UK to to the people who live here. They might be motivated by a feeling, a correct feeling, that these this international governance that that, that this these institutions full of pompous, unelected um, busybodies who sit and determine what liberalism is going to di dictate for the whole world, some people might may just get the feeling that those people don't have the best interests of, let's say, uh, for example, the, the, uh, uh, the, the British working class or the American working class. Maybe they have some other interests in mind. So there's all sorts of reasons that people push that lever, that they, they, they decided to side on that side. But, but there is behind that intuitive um, decision based on one or two issues or maybe three, behind that, there is a contest, a, a very real contest of ideas. Because if, if liberal internationalism 
is guilty of the kinds of things that it's accused of. For example, if liberal internationalism um, brings businessmen to the point that they are so, so disloyal to the nations that gave birth to them and gave birth to their enterprise, they're so disloyal that they're willing to say, look, it's my right to move my factory. I, it's my right to move my factories to China, and I don't have any responsibility to, my, to, 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 to the workers in, in, in my country. Because really, you know, who's to say it's my country? I mean, I'm a citizen of the world. All right? that, that is one way of taking the theory of liberalism and turning it into something that is absolutely intolerable to a great many people. Here's another way. Saying, um, you know, liberalism is just has just done so much good for America and Britain and France and Germany that, you know, that, that we need to make sure that it's happening everywhere. And then you, you, you know, in a, in a fit of righteous generosity, you invade Iraq and Afghanistan and start to impose whatever it is that you think is, 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 is right on them. I mean, we, we, could, we could keep going. There's the, there's the version of, of liberalism that says, well, look, um, Google, Facebook, Twitter, these are private companies. And the role of government is to protect the, 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 the rights of the owners, because after all, they built those companies. They're their companies. And if those companies start to interfere, to, to, to make it impossible to have democratic elections in, in, in your country, well, don't, don't worry. It's private property. There'll be market corrections. It, we don't need the government to take care of it, because it'll take care of itself. We read that in somewhere. And you, you, can go, you can go on and on, right? The, the people who are saying that the pornography should be on my child's cell phone. The government could do something about it, but they're not going to do something about it because liberalism says, look, it's a free business. If you don't like it, then take the cell phone away from your child. Good luck. <laughs> I, have, I, have, I have nine children. I haven't won this argument yet. It's easier to get the government to do something than to convince my children. Um, so, actually, even though we're, in the first instance, motiv mo motivated by particular issues, there's actually a titanic battle of ideas. And if you dig just a little bit under this, under Brexit, then you start to ask questions. Well, what is Brexit? Brexit is a, it's a, it's, it's an initiative to secure the the independence of the UK. What does that mean? Well, that the decisions should be made by the representatives, the elected representatives of, uh, of, of the British people or peoples. Uh, and and, and what, what do you mean by nation? Well, as soon as you mean, ask what do you mean by nation, then you have to start getting into questions like, is there something that holds people to, together, that makes them loyal to one another, that makes them feel like a part of one another. John Stuart Mill call, called this um, uh, fellow feeling or cohesion. Liberals hate the word cohesion. They believe there is no cohesion because there's only, there's only individuals making consensual choices. But conservatives, you're, you're, you're born into a family. It has a hierarchical structure. You owe your parents a, a honor according to our, our biblical tradition. You owe your parents honor, not just till you're 18 or 20, like the liberals say, but your entire life. So there's an assumption, a conservative assumes that, that there is such a thing as a cohesive society, a cohesive nation, which you know, always has diversity. Every nation is internally diverse. But the question is, are the different tribes and communities and subdivisions, are they loyal to one another sufficiently to hand power over in free and fair elections? Because it turns out that democracy can only take place within a, a, a loyal, cohesive community. There's never been, there's never been a, a, a democratic world empire that doesn't exist. There's only democratic nations. So you start digging into this, and you start to ask questions. You have to start to ask questions. This 800-year-old or 1,000-year-old Anglo-American tradition, what was in it that, that made it last so long? So people, you know, pe pe people know that there's a, a rights component, uh, that there's a, a balance of powers component, there's a certain constitutional brilliance. But beyond that, there's a nationalism. There's an assumption that the nation, regardless of what classes you're talking about, that all the parts of the nation have to have some kind of cohesion. And that in order to achieve that, there has to be some minimal degree of justice among the different groups. 
You know, the, you, you, everyone needs to be sufficiently honored at least so that they'll want to continue, they have to get enough out of it so that they'll want to be, continue being part of it. And then you start asking, well, these, just, these settlements that describe justice in the history of nations, how are they handed down? And then, and, and then you start getting into questions like, um, well, is it possible to hand them down without uh, a public religion, without a, 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 a public philosophy? As soon as you start asking questions like that, then, then you, you're diving deep into, got it. You're di diving deep into um, a traditionalist conservatism that may not be you know, something that everybody who voted for Brexit thought about. But the fact that not everybody thought about it doesn't mean it's not coming. Because it, it, it is coming. Year after year, people are doing more thinking and they're beginning to realize that if you're not a liberal, right, if you, if you are a conservative, then there are all these components of what conservatism is that have been tossed aside cavalierly, without thought. And maybe we, we're not going to readopt all of them, but all of them need to be re reconsidered because we need to understand what was that extraordinary inheritance of, you know, of, of, of England and later Britain. What was it? What, what was it? You need to know that in order to know what kind of force could defeat what we're facing. So the question, is now the moment for uh, national conservatism in the UK? I would say it's now or never. It's now or never. Time's up. We don't fully understand exactly what it is that, that, that national conservatism would mean in the UK. We need to talk about it, but we can see that if there's going to be a force that's going to stand against this ongoing cultural revolution that is destroying everything in its path, that force is going to have to involve a loyalty to an understanding of and a restoration of at least significant parts of that Anglo-American inheritance, of that British inheritance, which was the thing that, that made the UK what it was, that made it capable for it to propagate across so many centuries in such a brilliant way.